live. All right. <clears throat> okay, go live. <laughs> Going live. You're live. Okay, we're live. Oh, good. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Hi, guys. So this is our attempt on streaming live to everybody. Uh, welcome to the first Bitcoin session. Um, with you here currently is the derivative team, and we got a couple, or part of the derivative team, and we got a couple of guests. Uh, but first, we thought maybe we should introduce mm. each other. So um, I'll start with Isabel. Um, let me switch to a camera view here. There. So. Um, Right above me is Isabel. <laughs> and uh, Isabel is our chief community instigator. Uh -huh. Is that the right? Most That's... of you probably, I mean, yeah, this is perhaps uh, maybe a good description. Most of you probably know Isabel from the uh, website, Facebook, um, uh, Instagram, and the summit, and from personal interactions. So perhaps <laughs> not much of an introduction is needed here. So I'll leave it at that. OK, thank you, Marcus. Um, <clears throat> I'm watching us on YouTube, and it's really confusing because they're in the past. No, we're, we're in the future. OK, I'm going to introduce Greg, who is to my that way. And uh, Greg also doesn't really need any introduction, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best here. Greg, of course, is our uh, CEO and founder. And uh, he has a, a very long history in sort of the uh, tech and science industry since 1974. Um, he drew his first pixel on a, on a weather research ship in the Atlantic uh, in, in 1974. And then from 75 to 1980, he helped to train um, uh, simulators on the uh, US, uh, on, the, on the Canada Arm, Canada Arm Robotic Manipulator. So, and then, uh, Greg, I guess more relevant to this is that Greg founded uh, Side Effects, uh, the company that makes Houdini, and uh, and then uh, decided that uh, he wanted to work more in real time and started Derivative and Touch Designer to do real time, real to develop uh, a real time platform. Sorry, Greg. That's okay. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce Jared who's um, one of the co-founders of Derivative, along with uh, Rob Barrows. Um, Jared was with me at uh, Side Effects. And uh, Jared, I, 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 I describe what he does as the, the guy who does a deep dive on all the tough yeah. stuff in, uh, in Touch Designer. Whenever there's a super deep challenge, like new codecs, new devices, now streaming, uh, all sorts of uh, interactive things. Uh, Jared seems to be there to uh, do the deep dive on it. So uh, that's um, Jared. I, I guess Jared's background is kind of in technology, but also some music as well, and so on and so on. And uh, I, you also have a good background in partying as well. Jared was also uh, <laughs> Jared was also the um, uh, uh, main guy behind uh, Richie Houghton's Plastic Man. And uh, and uh, for all the projects we did at, at Disney, uh, Jared was with, with the uh, frontline person. So anyhow, that's uh, that. There's there you are, Jared. Okay. Well, thank you, Greg. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Um, and I guess I'll introduce Marcus. Uh, Marcus came to us uh, thankfully uh, from the heavens, uh, trained at Bauhaus mm -hmm. University, uh, and he was fresh out of university. He uh, he took over the Rush tour, I think, in the early days, which was a big step. Um, and now he does all the cool stuff at Derivatives. So he makes Camper <laughs> and uh, a lot of the like really crazy tools, like new tools that we have. He worked with White Void a lot. Was one of the original guys building the the uh, White Void. Um, uh, 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 What's it kinetic called? Kinetic lights. Kinetic light systems. He works with Carson Nikolai and makes all kinds of beautiful art installations. Does his own art shows. He just performed uh, live at Mutech uh, this year. So, uh, and uh, he, everyone knows him as the amazing guy who, uh, who who holds everything together. So, thank you, Marcus. Yes. <laughs> um, that was much more of an introduction than I thought we would give to each other. So, I have to add much more to you Isabel because oh yeah I feel I feel really really <laughs> short change no it's fine 
No, we're First, good. Though, I, I have to also make a correction because that's important. I had never finished university. Oh, <laughs> slacker. Uh, apparently, I never, said, I, I never said you did, by the way. Hired, uh, Marcus? Out of university, I get hired and then uh, by you guys and then thought, okay, well. You got yeah. past that. You don't need a degree. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Guys, apparently, but, um, we've, got a bad, uh, we've got a bad echo here. Oh. I don't hear the echo. Echo. I don't hear an echo this either. Is from, this is from YouTube. Oh, no. <laughs> Mm. Uh, echo. Why would that be? Echo. Okay, it sounds. Answer. Ben says it sounds fine in Japan. Okay, we'll just keep going. Okay, so where were um, we? We were actually. I just want to add that Isabel, when you came to us, we didn't have much of a public presence, and um, a lot of the development of the blog, or the development of the blog, and actually all the articles that are being made, is uh, due to your. Um, uh, investment of time and um, uh, looking at the community and getting yeah, in touch with yeah. the community. So, yeah. um, sorry. No, I was just going to yeah. say, I mean, go ahead. <laughs> uh, that's how our meetings usually are. <laughs> <laughs> Kitty. Maybe, maybe we can go to today's. Oh, yeah, that's my cat. One of them. Um, we can go to today's um, or what we're actually doing, what we're doing here, Isabel. Um, it's called In Session, and what's mm -hmm. the idea here? Yeah, so this is obviously the first episode, and uh, but it's something that we've talked about for a long time. We've batted around this idea of having a touch design, a call-in show, or kind of open office thing where people, you know, do exactly what we're going to do today. And it's kind of ironic that we had to close our office in real life to start this open office online, but uh, it's something that we'll keep doing. Um, so the idea to recap is that uh, we'll do this every three weeks and each session will have up to three community members reviewing their projects with uh, der 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 derivative staff. And the whole idea is to address questions, problems, optimizations and of course for everyone watching the stream to uh, um, also to learn from this and how can you apply you ask well um, there's uh, you can go to the deriv derivative website and uh, search in session and you will you will right away find an article that uh, uh, talks a bit more about what it is and uh, there's a form to fill out and uh, Fill that out and we'll be in touch. So um, yeah, there it is. Easy. Yes, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I guess to add, yeah, so for each session we'll 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 pick a few of them, some like something like three of them or so, and uh, go over them with the original authors. Live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live, yeah. All live. Like um, yeah, so please um, submit as much as you like. We um, uh, This was a quick one. We basically brought this online a week ago and then um, had a few submissions. And um, we, uh, we felt well, there's a long tradition in Touch Designer to be a tool for live art, um, perhaps uh, seated in uh, music history as well. And uh, hence, when we have two submissions that are dealing with audio visual visualization or audio reactive animation, then that was kind of a given that we should do this for our first um, session here. And that brings me perhaps to um, who our guests are today. Mm -hmm. And I'll bring, maybe I'll bring deep in. Deep in. Yeah, let's bring deep in. <laughs> You just, I just enabled your camera, so you should be able to uh, uh, speak and uh, hear us. And in the meantime, um, da -da 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 -da. yeah, let's see. In the meantime, maybe um, Isabel, what? There is Deep. Yeah. Know? So our okay. first, uh, our first guest today is uh, Deep Kumar, who is a VJ joining us from Bangalore, where it's probably two a.m. and uh, Deep 
Deep, in fact, means light in Indian. So he's got a really perfect name for a VJ. Um, so we'll just wait for him to find. To, oh, there he is. Hi, Deep. Can you see me? Hi. Hi yeah, we can see you. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Very good. Thanks. Really nice to have you with us today. So, um, um, as we were saying earlier, it's uh, it's it's pretty early in the morning there, but but uh, there's no VJ gigs tonight, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> But, but soon, I hope. So uh, you mentioned yeah. that you've been using Touch Designer only for five months or so, like a very short yeah. time. Yeah. yeah how, short time. how did you find it and how, how's it going so far? Uh, I just uh, I was just scrolling through YouTube for looking some how to create new via visuals, basically, on YouTube, looking for tutorials and all, so that I can create in After Effects and all stuff. So I go, cool. went through this Touch Design tutorials online. So I went through those few videos and all how to learn this thought that this is much more better than uh, buying visuals online like paying, totally. paying a few dollars and it's better to create your own visuals and performing at the live venue so that's when i installed mm -hmm. the touch design software and that's how when i started doing this stuff excellent um do you guys want to dive in or uh sure why not yeah um so Deep, you send us a file and um, maybe I'll start screen sharing. On... Yeah. Doop, doop, doop. Can you, uh, I think that's, yeah, sharing your screen. So um, yeah, we got the file from you here. And it's very nice. It has a nice uh, visual to it, basically a waveform animation in a way, uh, nice colors to it too. Yeah. And, um, oh, yeah, we have the request if mm. UDeep could turn up your volume a little bit, your uh, microphone. Um, How about now? No, it's still, still very quiet. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but it's quiet. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can hear them, though. Yeah, they're, yeah. Okay. It is just a lot yeah, softer than us. Yeah. Is, is it audible now? Okay, that's oh, better. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Thank nice. you. And um, so yeah, let's have a look. It's it's um, we uh, we thought maybe we'll we'll look at some general things in this file first, and uh, then get to a couple of questions and answers. Um, and one of the things that uh, happens, but it happens to a lot of us as well, is that uh, when we send files out to other people that we um, forget to um, reference files relatively or perhaps um, use files that come with Touch Designer just to, to make it easier. So for example, right now we have, um, we basically just have a path to a But what you can do is uh, on one hand, uh, you could go to the uh, Touch Designer uh, installation folder and da, 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 da. and in samples, there is an audio net uh, an audio uh, folder. Oops, sorry. And from there, basically, we can you can pick a file. And now this file is being or should be um, should be referenced as a, like a, a, a Python expression in here with a uh, .samples folder, which basically points to the derivative samples folder slash audio and then our default track here. Uh, side note, if you want to know what expressions uh, evaluate to, you can actually select parts of them and roll over and it's going to tell you uh, what it is. The other thing you can do with this is also uh, if you have a file in a project, there is this create project folder uh, which lets you um, make a project folder out of this here and add media folders. So, for example, audio. Uh, and, Marcus, um, apparently yeah. video is blocking the touch designer interface. Video is blocking. Oh, yes. Oopsie. There's too many videos. You know what? I'm going to turn off um, Isabel's video. And maybe Jared as well. And then this should be uh, should be better. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, so having this folder created, now you basically have everything inside the folder and you can move your audio files into that folder and have also a relative reference um, in your file dialog. Um, so what that means is, um, da -dum -da -dum. let me just place a uh, audio file in that folder. Da -da. Open files. Da -da. Audio, there we go. Okay. So now I can browse my project folder and um, we are in downloads, audio reactive wave here and there's the audio folder. Ugh. And now here the path is relative audio Jeremy P. Caulfield. So if you package up that folder now and send it out, then everybody um, everybody gets the uh, um, gets the same file. Okay, okay. So now I get the process how that works. That's just uh, yeah, just a little note on the side. Another thing, what's nice is if you have an audio device out, don't put it in line, but put it as a separate branch. So okay. Uh, so what's the difference uh, basically over there? The difference is that, for example, right now I have the audio device out deactivated so that we don't hear the music because it was a little bit loud. So I just clicked on active. And what happens is that the output of the audio device out is also nothing comes out basically if it's deactivated or if I change the volume. Mm -hmm. But perhaps you always want to have the audio in as the main volume, like the audio device out shouldn't have any um, shouldn't have any uh, uh, influence on that. OK, OK. So um, no matter if it's active or not, though, it will be reacting on the visuals still. Yeah, exactly. If it's deactivated, you can see here in the viewer that there's no movement in the graph. So that's basically, it, we, we won't be hearing the audio, basically, right? Yeah, you don't hear the audio, but also nothing is happening downstream here um, in your analyzing network. OK, OK. Um, so it's better to have it as a separate branch in general. Mm -hmm. um, I then went a little bit further and looked um, what's happening. So did you, um, how how did this file come to be actually? Was that uh, from a, like just experimentation or? Yeah, just watching a few tutorials and experimenting on my own actually. So what they what YouTubers show on their own tutorials, I just don't copy exactly the same thing actually. I try yeah. to create something different over there. And so this is no the point part. coming from him and me uploading on social media. It's no point over there. So I tend to experiment a lot in my stuff. And this is literally the fun part about the software, right? You can just um, take operators and bunch them up together. And then yeah. you get, um, you kind of see what the result is. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when looking through a file, what I often do is if you look at parameters and I want to know what did you do here or there is this bullet, um, what is it called? Bullseye. Bullet, bullseye, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, if you click that, it only shows the parameters that are non-default. So when you're looking at other networks from other people, this can be really useful because it tells you what was changed. Okay. Just don't forget to turn that back on once you're done. And uh, so this way I can basically go through a little bit and uh, see what's happening here. And with audio visualization, and this is um, like, this is the find basically, what you do is you take an audio waveform and uh, you identify perhaps certain characteristics of the audio waveform that you want to use to um, visualize. So your idea here is to, or you looked at the audio spectrum, yeah. and the audio spectrum chop is something that uh, gives you um, basically for, whoops, that was the oscillator, that gives you for every, um, for every frequency, it kind of gives you a strength of this 
of the signal at that frequency. And you can tell a lot about uh, what's happening in the music. Um, you have the lower parts um, on the left and the higher frequencies on the right. Now, in Touch Designer, the default for the audio spectrum is that it comes in uh, visualization mode, which is also um, the lower frequencies are a little bit stretched out, while the higher frequencies are a little bit bunched up together. Um, okay, okay. You can identify more the lower frequencies visually here. Uh, you mm -hmm. can always change that into a view how it would look like if it's a linear frequency um, scaling. So um, from zero hertz to uh, 22, what is it? 2250 hertz basically and every sample here is uh is the um is the uh not energy but the at a certain uh frequency level yeah exactly so um now the the next part here is basically that what you're doing is you're grabbing a part of the frequency spectrum you're trimming it um, you changed it a little bit um, the uh, resolution of the uh, of the frequency spectrum by setting the output links, and then you're trimming out a part, so you're getting a sh even shorter. Like you're getting the first 68 samples, and you can always look at what your um, what this channel data is, like the lengths, the amount of data that's in there by middle mouse clicking onto these operators. Um, yes. And then you, uh, this is going into an LFO. And uh, it's controlling the uh, um, the LFO, uh, like its own frequency, basically. It's yeah. applying an octave offset. Yeah. Now, it's only using the, uh, I think it's only using the first sample of the channel here, because this just creates one single sample as well, hence the difference in the graphs. And um, the the problem what I see when you're when you're doing um, audio visualization the problem I would see with this is that mainly it's actually controlled by the frequency of the LFO itself. Yes. The uh, the music doesn't very it doesn't have much of an impact here, right? Yeah, a little bit less impact, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so there's various ways that you could um, that you could control. So if you remove the LFO part, will the audio react to the visuals the way I want it to be? Uh, maybe not yet, because also the, the next part is that you're using a noise at the end uh, with a noise lookup. So what's happening is that you take a input value and you're looking into a um, noise field and you return a value from that noise field at a specific position. Okay. This is what the uh, X, Y, Z sam sampling points into a noise are. So you have to imagine you take a cube and you fill it with random data, and then you go in with a coordinate and fetch out one value. Okay. okay. Hey, Marcus. Yeah. Do you want to? Why don't you just put a trail after the noise and see how it's periodic, almost periodic. Trail. Yeah, that's a good point. A trail is very helpful in understanding what's yeah. happening. So you're just going back and forth in the noise field a little bit, but it's it's pretty much repeating. I mean, it's, it gets stretched and compressed a little bit because of the LFO feeding it, or because of the um, yeah the LFO being fed by your uh, trim. But it's still there's not much stuff happening here. It really isn't reacting to the music in a very direct way. Yep. So um, there's there's more chops basically that can help you convert this into something that uh, lets you that lets it uh, react more. And one of those is the analyze chop. The uh, um, if I just took up the analyze to the math here, um, then the the default uh, function that the analyze does is average. But there's an RMS power, which is excellent to judge the energy of the incoming waveform and this is something that reacts very nicely to the music actually uh, if we turn on the music a little bit 
And now you can see, um, not sure if you can hear the music, but uh, you can see how the lower graph here is actually react or is, is somehow symbolic for the music. Um, so for something like this, where you want this graph to, uh, like you're exporting onto a noise function, which, which is then used later on to uh, uh, displace a geometry, um, the, uh, the RMS power might be a really powerful or very useful tool in that, uh, in that sense. So we should try that. We should try to use this RMS power from the analyze chop and export that onto the uh, um, harmonic gain function here on the noise top. Um, and there's something else that we try to teach everybody. Um, try always to export or establish links between operators from null operators, null chops, null subs, null tops. They are they don't have much of a functionality otherwise, but um, right now I'm facing the problem that if I, like it's exporting from the noise chop, but I want to export from the analyze top. So what I have to do is I have to kind of remove the, um, remove the export here from the noise and then re-export from the analyze. What's really useful is, is if you apply the null chop and export from here. Because, oh, that was the wrong, that went to the wrong one, sorry. Export, dip. harmonic gain. Because now all I have to do is, I just take the output from the analyze and plug it into the null chop. And I get my, I get my, um, I get the export from there and the noise is reacting to what's coming from the analyze. So I even can switch between the two if I wanted to. You can add a switch chop, for example. And now switch between the two inputs here. Driven by the noise, driven by the analyze. Now, if you want to make this analyze a little bit nicer, what's very useful in these cases here is also a lag chop, for example, with a lag up and a lag down value. So that um, it, it basically jumps up to the maximum and then lags down uh, with a slight delay. So you can a little bit massage the signal to uh, make it look nicer or look to your liking, I should say. Um, yeah. So with that, it's basically always trying to figure out the, uh, what else did I write down here? And I, yeah, good. Another way, what you actually could do, um, Greg built this whole audio analysis network that's in the palette. So if you open up the palette, the palette can be opened up by clicking on this funny little icon under the to the right under the file menu, and then go to tools and find audio analysis, and then plug your audio file into the input. Now, if we look at that a little bit, here we've got actually um, uh, kick channel, snare, rhythm, low, mid, highs. So th this network already analyzes the music for us a little bit yeah. and splits it up in more defined values with a chop as an output. So if I wanted to, I could now use the uh, kick detection, for example. So I'll use a select. No oh, cat coming in. Um, <laughs> That's just how it is. <laughs> uh, kick detection channel. And 
uh, give that to. Nah, that's a little bit much. But basically, this lets you uh, f take out other um, other analyzing methods. Sorry. Yeah, select uh, select mid or something like that. One second. Got to deal with cat. Thank you. Um, select mid. Take away the kick detection. Perhaps also put this into a lag. Yeah. Well, the lag's kind of built into the uh, audio analysis as well. It's already built in. Okay. Yeah. And uh, maybe maybe try low just for the sake sake of this. Uh, uh, this demo. Yeah. So then you can, then on the audio analysis uh, component, you can soften it. And this would be the uh, yeah, or or by the UI, it's uh, it's panel. Oh, the UI, yeah. So I think I did trouble. It's smooth. It's a smooth oh. channel. Yeah, it does work. So you can always activate these UIs by clicking the your active button here, then um, or and then control it directly here, or you can also right click onto the operator, select view. Now you have this open, um, and now you can control like almost no reaction. Yeah, yeah. Turn down the uh, smoothness. Smooth. Yeah. There you go. So you gain a little bit more control over the whole thing, right? So it becomes a more an audio reactive thing, actually. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, before going into totally other modes of audio visualization, Craig, did you want to talk a little bit more about parts of the file? Sure. Should I over to you? Yeah. yeah, sure. Just a few other things, kind of in the same area that you were in at the beginning. So just switch over to me. OK, you can share. OK, so I. I I took the same file and did a few little things to it as well. Um, so the, the the bright green nodes here are your original ones. And I did the, kind of the same thing. I split off the audio device out as a separate thing so you can control this volume separately for what you hear versus what goes through your network. I kind of looked at the math job here and um, tried to figure out um, kind of, I, I see what you're trying to do here. Um, it, you're basically trying to turn maybe uh, a stereo channel into a uh, mono channel. So you can just do that by averaging, averaging the two channels. Um, that's not, maybe, that, that might be okay. Um, but what you did you, uh, in your original one, I think what you did is you had a um, negate and then a maximum. So I, I'm just gonna freeze frame everything here for a second and just look at it. Okay, there, there it is. Okay, so the original, uh, thing coming in had uh, well, basically this was off, and this was off. That's that's the original pair. So by negating it, what you're doing is you're just flipping it upside down. I think what you're trying to do is kind of find the you have two channels, so you kind of want to find the maximum power between the two. Maybe not the maximum power, but uh, the sum of the power between the two. So by negating it, it doesn't really do much to it. It just kind of flips it upside down, but it really doesn't. Um, take you towards getting more, more uh, figuring out what the power is. Um, what you did after that was then, um, I think, yeah, I took the maximum. So that's, um, that's okay, uh, but it, it kind of, what happens is um, it kind of hides one channel in favor of the other channels sometimes. So you kind of don't want to lose information. So I, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, let's say your two channels are something like this. I'm just kind of reproducing it for illustration. Uh, let's say you have an LFO, which is one left channel, and then kind of noise on your right channel. So that's your two audio channels coming in. 
So I'm merging them together. So I'm kind of faking a song. Um, but then uh, I just, I'm just putting down on a math shop and using the uh, settings, just like you had in your thing, it was negate and maximum. So uh, what, what you see happening here is, um, well, if we turn negate off, we end up with, um, keep your eye on this thing over here. Um, yeah, so, uh, doesn't look that different if you have negate on or off, on or off. But what, what you notice happening here is for part of the waveform, you see the left channel and the other part of the waveform, you see the right channel. So you kind of uh, lose information there. So using maximum or even minimum isn't the best way to do it. Um, one way of doing it is you could also take, um, well, what I would have suggested at the beginning, if we just turn this off, um, what I would have uh, suggested instead of negate, use make everything positive. Okay, so everything is above zero. And then from here, you might want to take the, uh, combine them by taking the, um, well, maximum won't, will do the same, have the same problem. But um, the thing I often do is I use length. Length keeps, um, keeps both the left channel and right channel information there. And uh, it's sort of like uh, if you have a X and Y, like left and right, uh, wherever you move in X and Y, you still end up with a, a line from the, the zero to wherever that is. You still preserve the information from the left channel and the right channel. So uh, length is kind of a better thing. And you don't actually need positive in that sense. You just do this. So that kind of keeps the information strong with the left and right channel. Um, it's sort of like finding the uh, power of it, but it's a more direct way for visuals. Um, so what I would have tended to do is to uh, forget this and just turn, turn, make it length and let that run. So that gives you um, an always, uh, always left and right channel being kind of recognized at to their maximum value. So, because um, length is in trigonometry, x squared plus y squared, square root, hypotenuse. Um, okay, so anyway, so this is one way of getting uh, like multiple channels into one. Even if you had like uh, eight channel audio, if you pass it into length, it'll use kind of eight dimensional space and figure out the length to it, and you'll end up with all eight channels being as strong as they all are. So that's a good thing to kind of feed into downstream. Um, and so spectrums, yes, so you end up with a signal that looks like this, which isn't quite, um, if you listen to this in a spectrum, it probably would, oh, we'll try and listen to it. Uh, let's turn this off. And um, I don't know if you can, you'll be able to hear this or not, but let's see. Turn on some volume. Okay, let's listen to what that sounds like now, our result. Yeah, so it's kind of weird. Pretty quiet. Oh, it's quiet? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, okay. I don't think you can hear it. Okay, um, let's skip that. Anyway, it sounds all garbly, but that's okay. Uh, let me turn it down for myself, though. There, okay. So. Um, so anyways, you feed, you feed the signal into audio spectrum and that, that's fine. And you trim out part of it, that's, that's good. Um, and, and as Marcus said, uh, what, what LFO uh, takes is just a single number. So it doesn't take the whole signal here. It just takes uh, a time slice of it. Like um, basically what it's doing is, anyway, I don't want to get into time slicing, but it, it basically takes one sample out of this whole thing. And it, it would look like this. If you pass this in a time slice, that's the sample you would get that would be actually fed to that. So what you're doing now or this is exactly the same thing. So it's it all this is doing is wobbling the LFO up and down. So um, the LFO, just for your information, is um, it's uh, actually this is one of the I mean, people say, and I say that touch designers influenced by synthesizers like the ARP 2600. This is a direct ripoff of, of it. Um, the LFO chop and the um, oscillator chop, audio oscillator chop, they both use one an input where 
Um, you have a um, LFO is basically a, has a frequency of some number of cycles per second. And uh, what the input does, the first input does, which is the octave control, is if you add one to it, it doubles the frequency. Let's put uh, LFO on a trail. Okay, so you see how it oscillates here. So if we add one to the input, we have zero, so there's no no change to its input. So if we add, just add, set it to one, well, one. So it's going at double speed now. And if you do add two, here's where it gets kind of interesting because it's um, logarithmic. If you add two, it's, it's four times the speed. It's two octaves higher. So two octaves is uh, um, four times the frequency. And that's how oscillators keep in harmonic um, progression going from one octave to another. You just add on the 26 arc 2600, you just add another volt to the input and you get another octave. Another volt gives you another octave. So this is, look, works exactly the same way. So that's just a kind of FYI. And, and it's, it also works going negative. So do, 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 get a voltage of minus one and goes at a, a half the frequency. So that's just kind of a bit of a primer on, on LFO. Um, one, so I have two other points to make here. Um, one is that um, in the LFO here, um, what you're doing, which is kind of okay, um, you, you hit the bullseye here and see what you change. Um, by default, the LFO is, uh, goes between minus one and plus one as per this. Yeah, that's the range, minus one to plus one. So what you're doing here, which is totally legit, is to, if you want it between zero and one, you uh, you do what you did here. Uh, half the amplitude and half, 0.5 of an off offset. But then what you do is you're passing it to a math shop here where you're, where you're taking, where you're taking the, the range from here is minus one to plus one. And... Um, and uh, turning that to, to a range of zero to 0.8. So rather than bothering to do it in two places, I would do it in one place. I'd go back to the uh, LFO, reset the parameter, uh, and right click on amplitude, reset the parameter, set it back to one. So, you know, so now minus one plus one, get rid of this. And on the math chop, um, I'd say here, well, I know the range is minus one to plus one, so let's make it minus one to plus one. And that gives you exactly the same result, except, yeah, so you can see now your output is zero to 0 0.8, exactly what you wanted, but you, you did it in one step instead of two steps. Okay, yeah. that makes sense? Okay, and, okay, so that's cool. So by the way, um, I, <laughs> well, I'm the author of this, of some, some of these things. So of course I know what's going on, but um, just in touch, touch design in, in general, you just learn tricks as you go, you learn shortcuts as you go. Every month I find things, and it's after working with it for 20 years, every, mo every month I find better ways of doing things, better shortcuts. And some of the shortcuts I pick up from other people, sometimes I stumble on them, sometimes I find them by uh, going into operator snippets, and seeing what other people have done in as, as examples. So uh, like it's like every like little trick you see here is based on some discovery of some optimized workflow. So don't feel bad if you, or your next networks get messy and, and stuff like that. It, um, it, you'll just you'll just learn to do it better and better each time that you um, to go at it. So um, I had one other, I just picked up one thing in a, uh, in the middle of the network. Um, and Marcus, you may want to go to another part of it as well. But um, so here you um, you have a one uh, node here, and then you want to add white as a background. So um, this is what the most most basic thing is that people do is they take, okay, let's take a white picture, let's do an over. Um, and I bet you what happened here, I mean, let's go to the over. Uh, right. So you had to, to keep the thing at this uh, resolution of um, 350 by 50, to keep the thing at the re resolution 350 by 350, you had to change the fixed layer parameter here like this, input two. 
Right. That's probably what happened when you first put that over that. So, um, so fine that you'll, you have to do that sometimes you make it a fixed layer and you, you do that. That's fine. But there's also a, a, a cheaper, quicker way to, um, basically fill an image with a color background and that's to use the transform chop. So with the transform chop by default, um, hang on, let me just, okay. By default, it does basically does nothing to the image. Um, but with transform chop, you can fill the background with a color. So you can go to the place where it says background color and uh, put in here a RGBA of 1111. And oh, yeah, uh, th this is off by default. So um, there's OK, there's a subtle difference, but you have to turn this flag on comp over background color. And that's what you get. So this 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 would be um, equivalent to what you did down here. So we can pass the transform drop into null six and go from there. So I know that, to create an over again to right. Line. Yeah, right, 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 right. Okay, and same thing with a uh, text top. Actually, um, with 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 a text top, often you uh, text te text or uh, even some of the other ones, uh, text talk. Um, you do I need uh, the content to be over there, or do I need to remove it? Uh, sorry, what? Do I need the content to be there? No, or do I have to remove it? no. And 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 in this case, you would you would you would just remove it. Oops. Yeah, you don't need that at all, right? So if you remove that, then also by my final image will be still. The yeah. Way I want it to be. Yeah. Right. Because your your resolution won't have changed. Okay, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in case of, uh, for instance, even the text top, you have a, uh, you, you feed it, a, you can just feed it a, an image and it'll basically t put text over that image. You don't have to create a blank one with no, uh, nothing in it, uh, with a color in it or something. You, you, you can just apply it as an input to the text top. And this thing also applies to feeding things into um, a, uh, rectangle top, for instance, or circle, uh, the rectangle. Uh, well, it's a bad example, but uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, you can, for some of the nodes, some of these nodes are uh, like the black ones here are uh, zero input nodes, the sources, um, but some of them do accept an input, like text top, it does accept an input, an optional one. And same thing with uh, circle and rectangle, but um, more on that later, we're going to soup up the um, uh, circle and rectangle to do groovier stuff, but that'll be in another session that we do. Okay, um, that's it for me, Marcus. Okay, um, so maybe... Uh, stop. I just wanted to go over a couple more things, uh, just very quickly, a few minutes. Um, we do have audio file in. We have um, talked about how to get this down to a single uh, waveform. Uh, and let's listen to a little bit of Jeremy P. Caulfield here. <laughs> um, where is it actually? Here. Now you should be able to hear that. Um, or here. Okay. So, uh, what else can we do actually with the signal? And in Touch Designer, a lot of things that are very simple transitions from one type of data to the other type of data. And then you can start working with this as an audio visualization. So, um, given here my mono uh, waveform, I can move this to. Um, to a top, for example. So, chop to top. So, what I'm creating here is um, a one pixel image of the length of my um, audio channel here. So, between 735, and I'm dropping some frames, 735 and the double of that 1470 uh, samples long. Now, um, it's a little bit hard to see here, uh, but what we can do is we can um, 
change the resolution of this always on the common tab uh, not limit uh, custom resolution and change that to 1280 by 720 and then um, use input doing XD texture resolution of 1280 what what am I doing I'm doing something wrong here <clears throat> Not quite sure. Sorry. This should be a very simple example. All right, let's make a workaround here. Not reorder. We'll take a resolution top and change this to custom resolution 1280 by 720. Um, and use the uh, aspect as the resolution and now you created this kind of line graphic here so um this can be always used as a nice background or um, a punch in effect as well now we could go a little bit further with this because there's more chops that speak to audio for example the audio filter um not the audio movie um audio filter which lets you um, parse out certain frequency. So currently I have a low pass. So let's say I'm only getting out all the frequencies that are below 100 Hertz or something like this. Um, and there's a different, you can specify it in logarithmically or as the actual cutoff frequency. And you can change which one you wanna specify by changing the cutoff units uh, parameter here. So now I'm only getting the uh, um, the uh, low frequencies here. And let me just change this to an RGBA. But that's what apparently is broken. Legacy, okay. No, it's not broken, but I'll put it onto legacy. Um, and now I'll copy that and make this a band pass, for example and get something in the mid-range, perhaps. Copy that again. Make this a high pass. And so now what I've created is a low frequency display, mid frequencies and high frequencies. And for example, I could put all of this with a reorder top back into one image and the reorder top lets you reassign one to the other um, um, one to the other channel so my input one can go to the red channel now i can say output green should be from input two going to the green channel and input three output blue going to the blue channel. So now I have this more colorful display of three different frequency bands. Similarly, I can use these um, operators here, these uh, textures to display graphics, to recreate a visual, um, a visual display of a, a waveform. Um, dum -dum -dum. So let me just create a constant with 1280 by 720. Now I can leave that actually like this and make use of the display stop. So this is a lot of basically experimentation as well. Like you can just play around with these tops a lot. And I'm gonna use my base frequency here as the second input. I have no horizontal displays, but a vertical displays. And um, set the extent to zero. Kind of playing around with the parameters lets you discover what they all do. And I've got a waveform display um, in a sense. Like you can, there's so many variations of the same system. Um, uh, yeah, it's very, lots of ideas there. Um, last but not least, I wanted to point you to a, um, 
to uh, let me just turn this off. There's lots of resources out there for audio visualizations and um, one place to always check is our website, uh, the uh, community section. Um, Here we can basically search for, if you click on the filters and then select assets, apply, and then search for, let's see, just audio. Um, then you perhaps can find uh, some things that might be in the direction of audio visualization, although I don't see much here. But there's also GitHub, and GitHub has a lot of resources for touch designer and audio visualizations. And um, I'll share this here with you in the chat as well. But uh, we do, have, I posted these uh, seven simple audio visualization techniques as well that uh, kind of give a different range of, um, yeah different range of techniques that can be uh, easily recreated with top top or um, yeah shops as well and um, we are kind of approaching the 3 p.m hour mark already so uh, that was probably a lot of stuff we just talked about deep yeah, I hope I <laughs> yeah, but I'm understanding a lot of stuff actually right now. It really helps me a lot. That's good. Stuff. Great. Um, and uh, so, well, I, I had a doubt actually. Uh, is it possible that you can connect this software to a projector and do the mapping on the any specific object? If it's possible. Or do we need a VGN software for that to do it specifically and uh, do, uh, do it, uh, what do you call, sir? Um, no, you can, uh, that's one of those things. Uh, there's a really good um, website, alltv.org, that has lots and lots and lots of uh, touch designer tutorials. Okay. Uh, when it's loading. And you're going to find a lot of mapping tutorials. And I'm just going to point you to two tools that are included in the palette. If you go to tools, there is the uh, content mapper, which lets you uh, draw shapes onto shapes that you might be projecting on and then assign texture to these shapes. Or you use the other tool is the uh, cam snapper, which if you have a model of the um, of the object that you want to project onto, let you calibrate the projector that you want. But I would refer you to this website, alltv.org, with lots and lots and lots of tutorials. Um, and there, if you look for mapping, I bet I never looked for it. But I'm sure there must be something. Yeah. So there's, there's a few tutorials here that deal with all different kinds of mappings. Um, there's a lot. Okay, okay, thank you so much yeah. for that. <laughs> um, yeah, alltv.org, a really nice initiative by um, Jan from Berlin. Uh, if you wanna support him, he also got a Patreon channel there. So, um, there are some questions from YouTube. Let's see. Audio signal smoother, Greg. Is there a way to make an audio signal smoother so that animations will smooth out as well? The filter chop often causes a delay. What would be your suggestion there? Hmm. Of course, lag is less delay because it reacts right away. Um, yeah, it reacts right away. Uh, and, and, and sometimes I blend together a lag and a filter. I take a signal, um, send it through lag, and send it through filter uh, with this short filter range, uh, filter uh, time, and um, and then blend them together with a cross, cross chop, something like that. 
Um, there are other predictive ways of doing it, which um, we don't have quite right now, but that's one suggestion. Um, and another question comes from David Brown. What uh, are your latest preferences for splitting panels in Touch Designer and making a good workflow? Splitting panels, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know what? Um, I often it often doesn't get much more complex than this for me that I'm just splitting. Um, but those are. But that, that, those, those are, I think he means uh, um, panels, not panes. Oh, panels, splitting panels. Um, uh, how do we do that? Um, splitting panes, uh, panels. I'm yeah. not really sh too sure what, uh, yeah, sorry, no. Um, I mean, is this using the fill options and the uh, and all that kind of stuff with pa with panels? Is that what what he is referring to? Uh, he, he must know. David Braun must know about all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would think so. Sure, yeah, but I mean, if we're talking about uh, panels in general, then yes, um, the children left to right or whatever line method, and then um, hmm. thing. Um, yeah, Using the uh, uh, fill method on the horizontal mode or vertical mode, or whichever way you uh, align them, this is personally for me the way to go. Um, not using the, you only have one level maybe where you actually assign the size, but otherwise it's all mm -hmm. dynamic. I'm sure, I'm sure Jared would be happy to answer that too. But uh, David apparently says, "Yeah, pains. It was about pains." Oh, ooh, but uh, um. Pains pro pro by program at by programming them or just doing it by hand. Uh, I think by hand, mm -hmm. but uh, we can uh, perhaps yeah uh, discuss that later a little bit because I think we should be going on to our next uh, part here. Yeah, hey, uh, hey Marcus. Uh, yeah, I'd like to just uh, uh, before we get on to the next half. Um, uh, just announce something that's happening after our session. And uh, that's something that uh, is a, a live performance with uh, Touch Designer uh, Mixa, the video mixer that uh, came out about five, six, seven years ago, but it's being done by Peter Mettler. It's part of a festival, uh, European festival on uh, video art and, film and filmmaking. Um, do you want to switch over to my screen, uh, to my um, uh, shared Greg. screen? Greg, yeah. it's actually it's on the um, it's it's on the streaming page on our website. Yeah, the link. I, I'm just going to get to something. It, the, the, it, it's actually the link's broken. So um, okay. So are you? Do you have, are you um, on? You can just people have see? To share. Oh, I can share. Da, 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 sure. da, da. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so how was that deep? Oh, it was very nice actually. I learned a lot from this. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. Yeah, you guys are really amazing. Thank cool. you. Mm, it was great to have you. Are you tired? No, no. <laughs> actually, I'm used to it staying up uh, late at night actually. Okay, then, then, then this software is perfect for you. <laughs> you've, come okay. to the right, you've come to the right place. Oh, I was going to recommend that you join. Um, there's a very good online community, the Touch Designer Help Group. You should uh, you should you should join because uh, uh, people ask and answer a lot of questions and are very very helpful. Uh -huh. no, sure, I will join definitely. No okay, so um, um, starting at uh, four o'clock um, our uh, Toronto time, which is like an hour from now. Um, Peter Mettler will be um, performing for the Vision de Real 2020, 51st edition. Oh, 51st, holy cow. Um, and it's um, it's an event that's, um, let me jump over to the touch. It, it, there's a link here, but it's busted to get to the uh, live show. But um, it's, it's actually here um, or there, yeah, okay. It's this site here, Vision de Real CA, da, 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 da. We can put it up at, if, later on, but this is where you go. And on the right, chat, Greg. What's put that? It in the 
And we'll put, put, it, in the put, it, put it in the chat, yeah. Okay, I'll put it in, into uh, the big market chat? Yeah. Okay, I'll do that in a second. Whoops. Yeah, so this is this is where you go to uh, to, to watch it. So basically, it'll be uh, split screen and Peter, Peter's uh, user interface, plus uh, his video out, plus uh, camera on his all of his controllers and stuff. And it'll be based on some work that he's done in the past. Be live VJing. Okay, so I'll read you, Marcus. <clears throat> Okay, Deep. Well, thank you very much for being our first, um, first guest ever guest. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, we we we, we got to give him a first ever guest badge or something or or. Yeah. Oh, banana sticker, banana sticker. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Isabel, send him a banana, banana sticker. Come on. Yeah, I, don't, I don't. I I'm not going to the post office. <laughs> um, hope to see you soon again in the community and let us know what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I keep you posted. Thank you very much. And uh, see you soon. Be... Stick around because yeah, we around. are going over to the next um, to Thanks, the next part here. Uh -huh. um, and yeah. what is that? Can we, can we bring them back in? Uh, yes, of course. We have, oh, wait. Um, Adrian is here. Um, and. Uh... I think Jigs is here too. Oh, Hi, yeah. Adrian. Hi. Jigs, I don't see currently, but Jigs, Jigs wrote in the chat that he was around, but he had no camera. Oh, or... Wait, Jigs is having a little bit of computer issues getting back in, so I'm not. I'm trying to figure out if he was able to make it back in. I hope he can. Um, yeah, I see him in the list now. So maybe we can talk a little bit about. Here um, we go. Oh, he's cooking. He's making us some food. <laughs> There's his stove. Okay, so uh, while that's happening, um, welcome Adrian Oneiga to uh, our first edition. So uh, Adrian is an audiovisual artist who also works with sound, uh, I believe, and. Uh, Basically, you're not very tool or medium specific. Like you will use whatever is best for, for this project. And uh, and, uh, and 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 the interesting thing here is that uh, when things move from you, you kind of move from physical to digital art as everything was sort of shutting down. And uh, um, you you've, uh, you've you've coined a, a phrase that I actually thought of a couple of days ago, but now it's yours, and it's. Uh, Social instancing. So please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, no, it's our phrase. We okay. Okay. That. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> do you want to talk? Do you want to talk a bit about uh, what? Uh, well, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. this was all made possible by uh, <clears throat> by Jigs and Scan Truck guys, who uh, glad, gave you yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for joining us, D Jigs. Yeah, thanks, um, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah cool. so I mean, Adrian had uh, Adrian had sent us a link to you guys, and we watched the video, and lo and behold, it turned out that you had used Touch Designer for the interface of uh, of your of your scanning system. Absolutely, yeah. We worked with um, Aaron Toman. Um, he designed our UI using Touch. Um, there's a lot of great features. Basically, we can globally control all of our 210 cameras. Um, with touch um, it also he designed this page where if anything goes wrong in the system with um, each camera has its own raspberry pi so if a pie were to go down or if um, a cable was loose or anything we that we can go fix it really quick um, and it's been great using touch just because you know if anything ever um, we never had any issues oh. with it um, as far as, you know, it crashing or anything like that. And you can't really say that about all software. So um, it, it's been great. And we can always upgrade it too. Whenever the, the technology changes, wow. we, we can kind of move with that, you know. That's incredible. So that's that's very, very good to hear. But so everything fits in the truck and you basically drive to the scanny. Yeah, we do a lot of lot of uh, feature films, TV, um, but yeah, we've uh, we've now been getting a lot of um, calls. Basically, since we did this project with Will Smith, um, where he'd been scanned, you know, five or six different times for big movies, 
um, but he never had access to his own avatar. So um, he and his production company, Westbrook, re reached out to us and said, hey, we want to create digital will so we can do crazy stuff um, <laughs> on Instagram, which we thought digital was really will. cool. Yeah, it's a cool use case, too, because it's like, really, I mean, you can you can mess with it till the end of time. Um, so we're excited, you know, trying to make lemonade out of the current situation in Hollywood right now and um, hmm. provide some sort of a solution um, to people right. being able to create content safely. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. Really, really smart application, actually. <laughs> perfect. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't want to say perfect timing, but uh, oh, we have video. I just thought, yeah, maybe a little bit of a <clears throat> um, visual idea of what's happening there, or an animated idea of what's happening there. Uh, brings back memories. <laughs> oh, oh, did you shoot yes, this, we've... Adrian? Yeah, you shot this, right? No, I just. I just oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so we we built all the, the the whole rig is built on stabilization uh, pads. So essentially, the whole thing is floating within the truck. So when we take hits on the 405, or someone cuts me off when I'm driving it, uh, mm -hmm. the cameras <laughs> the cameras all stay where they should stay. So that's uh, yeah. that's nice. We always recalibrate when we, um, but basically that's just tightening up focus on you know a handful of cameras Incredible. to make sure everything's tack sharp. Yeah. Yeah. And we've actually been using touch um, recently. We've been going into a lot of R and D, um, you know, given that Hollywood's been on pause um, and uh, we're working out our post workflow um, to try and automate a lot of the, the processes. Um, and we're using touch for that as well. So. Amazing. <clears throat> Downtime is good for R and D. Exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, Adrian, tell so, us a bit about uh, tell us tell us a bit about about this journey of yours here. Well, um, you know, Jigs and I have been friends for probably what like a good ten years or so. I mean, years ago. So, I, you know, I've just been enjoying just watching some of my friends really, you know come into a really beautiful place with art and, and everything. As all of us are like evolving through the art farms, you know, there's just been kind of like, you're kind of tuning into the time and figuring out what's like, what feels relevant. And it's funny because um, we finally got around to scanning me last year. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be hilarious because, um, you know, I guess I started, like you said, I started with like a painting, physical medium and music and all this stuff. And then eventually got into like, audiovisual projection mapping and just like filmmaking everything just kind of rolled into one thing and I was like well it's all an expression of itself so yeah, yeah. I've always embraced the whole and um, I feel like even though in some ways it sets me like it take you know it's like when when somebody like specializes in something it like you can kind of like get ahead in like a one lane but like my I've never felt right about just like leaving parts of me behind so it's like it's been a slow boil and so um it's been amazing to kind of like witness it over the years of like how everything comes together and um yeah at this, at this point i was like well you know you i'm an artist i i'm express myself in all sorts of ways and the the one classical thing that our, every artist does is a self-portrait like a painter paints mm -hmm. himself or herself and so I was like, well, obviously, if I'm working in digital, like, and one of my home, like, one of my really good friends is like, has a scanning thing, like, I might as well just get in there and like, see what can, we can do. And it's, yeah. it's really funny because now we're in a stage where we're socially distancing, and you know, it, 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 it's, it's an interesting time to bring us to life. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I felt like it maybe, was a good um, time. maybe, maybe Jigs will drive up to Toronto. Yeah. Scan I mean, us. <laughs> that's the brilliant thing about the scan drug. It's like it goes where oh, the action is, you know. Or we could meet yeah. halfway. I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, wh whatever the 405 is connected to. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah. where is Jared? Is do uh, I'm not sure. Looking for him, but in We're the meantime, for, for comedic for comedic relief here. Um, what we're basically oh, yes, trying yes, to do yes, yes. is uh, <laughs> oh, make oh people God. dance, right? Um, right. Adrian, is that you? 
Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's um, Raver Girl. <laughs> so this was this was digitized with one camera. No, not really, but uh, that's an example from I don't know, Craig, how old is that? Uh, uh it was made in was made in um nineteen ninety seven. it was um first first made an appearance at the inter in, at the interactive dance club at SIGGRAPH. And it was made by Leo Chen, and it was based on his an, a visual analysis of uh, um, a, a friend of ours who would go to all the raves and parties, and had she had certain really special moves. Hey, Marcus, hit the hit the one key or two key on your keyboard. Hit the one key or two key on your keyboard, Marcus. Marcus. Is oh, those the ones at the bottom. Yeah, the ones at I the got, bottom I left. Here, yeah. Okay. Hey, Jared. Okay. Yeah, there. Okay. Yeah, she had. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So, so our friend had these 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 poses that she would go to. So Leo kind of keyframed her, and well, she didn't. No keyframes here. It's all just oscillators and uh, uh, single poses. But uh, it's it's amazing in what she can get out of uh, 22 channels. Hi, Jared. Yeah. So you're Hello. looking at yeah. So you're looking at uh, one of the synths that was part of the. Touch Designer 017 from 2007 uh, CD of uh, wow. uh, 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 synth files. And a few Touch Designer users have a copy of that. So. That's amazing. It goes way back. Yeah, so anyway, that was uh, one of the first um, simple real-time things that was made by just before Touch Designer was born. Is it like as in, I think it would be with, uh, that's basically Houdini version wow. 2.0 or something like that it it's so amazing what has been unfolding through this like collaborative platform that i've seen and so you know i feel like what touch designer does for me is it really brings together like control signals across different application and there's so much flexibility yeah. there that like right now i'm just like you know bringing together like all the things that like I'm passionate about, so I have, like sounds weaving into visuals, into control signals, and and it's all based around this like singular workflow. Now I'm just like, wow, I'm just starting to build these different environments, and you know, and 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 application software. They're all ecosystems now. It's like it's, it's mm. amazing the age we're in right now. So, and I feel yeah. like um, Touch Designer is one of those applications that's like it's. Um, it's so versatile that it like really allows for this place of like, you know, you can bring and create the sort of like living, breathing, like um, control. Like I think for part of what I'm, what I really love about it is that like you can build out like responses and, and like uh, interactions and things like, and, and it can, you know, it's really, you can patch it out to anything. And that's, that's what's really special about it, you know? So yeah, it's okay. let's, really let's, great. Let's, uh, great. I think we should dive in under the hood and see what see what you guys have cooked up all night last night. <laughs> yeah, basically I got the scan from Vlad about two days ago. So this is literally hot, hot off the press. And um, you know, I um, had the pleasure of finally connecting with Jarrett, who is absolutely brilliant, and we kind of discussed about some ways for to connect um you know, a piece of music, which, you know, the, the song I play is it's something I'm working on and to connect that into Ableton, but to send live signals into touch to control in real point, like a 3D model that happens to be me. So what is going to happen is basically the MIDI clips are sending different, um, they have different information, such as like note informations, um, uh, different envelopes of like MIDI, MIDI CC signals that are being sent into Touch Designer. And um, what you're going to see is literally just um, a 3D scan of me with some dance moves loaded in there. And, and you know, we can just kind of see what's going on <laughs> whenever it's happening. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, I think I think we, we're, we're up, we're, we can see our screen now, right, Marcus? Yeah. 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 Good. Okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, uh, it was pretty exciting. I, I got to meet Adrian for the first time. We're friends of friends, obviously. Uh, Jigs and Adrian both live in LA, just like me. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've heard uh, through many friends about Adrian already. So uh, we've got finally got to hang out. 
Um, apparently, he likes to work late at night as well, so it worked out well for us. We started work around midnight last night. Um, I and... was good asleep, and he convinced me otherwise. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So he this the scan that you see here um, is is from Jigs' system, um, and uh, so I think that it's probably going to be useful to just really quickly, if you can, Adrian, talk about. Uh, what happened after Jig scanned you? What did he give you? And then what did you do to get a skeleton into this system and turn it into what is now an FBX asset that we imported? So gotcha. why don't you just give yeah. some background. So um, basically when um, Jigs and Vlad scanned me, they, they did the original scan and then uh, Vlad um, took my um, like really high resolution, high polygon model and like, just simplified it so that it's not like a heavy load on the computer. And that um, allowed me, that allows for like being able to do stuff like this where you can like manipulate in real time. And, um, you know, uh, being short of time, I just used um, Adobe's Mixamo um, uh, extension, which is actually pretty handy. And, you know, just put a, put some bones in my um, in my model, and um, you know, in this case, it's it's really just a, it's more of a test. It's it's like they have a bunch of really cool presets of like movements. So, um, you know, down the road, like you know, we have like you can always integrate like a mocap suit or you know other movement libraries. But like in this particular case, it was like really cool to be like, well, literally, we made the decision to come on live today. So this was like. Wednesday night, I think like 12.30 p.m. that Vlad hit me with the, the render. So like literally this is like hot off the press. Like we're not even like, you know, anywhere. Like this, this is like as bare bones as the project could be, you know, which is actually kind of cool because if you think about like the amount of um, sophisticated technology that goes into something like this, it's like we can do this in a day. You know, it's, kinda, it's actually kind of really cool when you think about what all that went into that, you know, so. And yeah. so, so what you gave me, um, what we kind of started with was um, <clears throat> a model. Was, was really yeah an FBX file. So you, you gave me a bunch of these guys. So if you look on the disk here, um, mm -hmm. eventually you gave me a bunch of these guys. So um, that that's what you output from Mix, Mixamo, right? Yeah, exactly. And Mixamo has a website that has a bunch of motions on it, right? And then you just pick yeah, from a, exactly. a library, a menu of motions. Um, so the most okay. basic. So yeah, I'm just going to chime in, uh, Isabel yeah. and Jix. Do you, you want to do you want to turn off your cameras as well? Sure. Then on yeah. YouTube, there's more <laughs> um, people can see more of the screen. Bye guys. Thanks. Absolutely. See ya. Thanks. Um, okay. So this, how much time do I have, Marcus? Because there's a ton of stuff in here. Well, um, thirty minutes. Do yeah, thirty thirty five minutes basically. Okay, cool. All right, I'll try to keep the pace right. So um, this system starts with importing an FBX file, which is essentially just going um, and grabbing the FBX file and dragging and drop it onto touch. And you'll get one of these FBX components, which are fairly new. Um, we, uh, Eric, uh, uh, one of our programmers, spent a, a lot of effort uh, building a pretty sophisticated system underneath for both the FBX importing and the USD importing. Um, it comes with a component which has various playback controls which you might recognize from um, our movie player or the timer chop and stuff. So this allows you to play back animation. Um, uh, Adrian wanted to go a lot deeper and have Ableton Live trigger the animations. So that was an interesting question. I was like, hmm, can this be, is this possible? So. Um, so, uh, if we look inside the FBX, you'll see, uh, there's, there he is there. Um, we also, I guess, uh, Jigs made these, uh, these textures available from the scan as well. So he gives you an, a, a properly texture coordinate set of geometry. It's nice and clean. It's beautiful geometry. Uh, and then, uh, the, the, his, his face is normals and, uh, uh, it looks like ambient occlusion. Uh, so we just quickly put together a PBR, and that's what that's why we see the FBX file loaded uh, and textured. There's an environment light um, for the to drive the PBR, and there's just a single 
um, there's a single directional light on it as well. <clears throat> so um, the, so ultimately, I knew that he, he wanted to trigger animations um, when you uh, in Ableton, which he gave me an Ableton file, um, when, when, he, when he clicked on a clip, essentially. So, um, so we decided to make a system that when you clicked on this clip, um, you could fill in the name of the clip that you wanted to play. So, um, so we needed to make animation clips that worked, and they needed to load into the Clip Blender. Uh, so that's kind of the core of the system, is that you load the FBX file. We created a, a clip processor, which extracts the animation from the FBX file, and it does various things to make it compatible correctly with the Clip Blender, uh, which I'll get into. And, um, and then uh, I'll show you a really simple example of the Clip Blender by going into op uh, Operator Snippets, just as a sidetrack here. So the, the basic message here is if you have a clip, if you have a FBX asset with animation in it, then uh, you can load the FBX asset just like this one. And then you can extract the animation from the, um, from the FBX asset by using the import select chop. And the import select chop, uh, you, you essentially just reference the FBX asset just by dragging and dropping it on there and making the import parent uh, point to the top level FBX component. And then you go to the playback page and you pick the animation from the asset. And so there, in this case, there's three animations embedded in this. So how you embed animation into an FBX asset is sort of a question depending on the software, Maya, Houdini, uh, Cinema 4D. I know they all do it. I'm sure Blender does it pro probably really well as well. Uh, I think we determined that, that uh, Mixamo is only one animation per asset, so that's why we imported all the asset, the FBX files over and over again. Um, there's probably a way to get all those animations packed into a single asset, so that's kind of the more ideal situation. So once the animation is, is extracted, so it's extracted here, there's a run, a punch, and a shot animation. And then uh, we want to load it into the Clip Blender. And the way that the Clip Blender works is you first tell it a basic uh, clip to run. So in this case, the running clip has been made the default clip. And if you just load a clip chop with channels in it, the clip chop does a bunch of things. It loads animation channels, which are going to be transforms for bones. Uh, and so in this case, you can see there's there's a hip transform, there's a spine transform, and on and on and on. There's 264 channels. And when you put it into the clip chop, it loads the animation, and it also applies attributes for quaternions. And with this, there's certain operators in Touch Designer, for example, the clip blender chop, that uh, use quaternions um, so that you can blend between transforms. And so that would allow you to blend from one animation to another. So um, all of these get applied with a clip chop. And then now with the clip blender loaded, and um, now you create an empty table. And this is this, the animation. This is the home for the animation sequence that you're going to feed it. So if you come to the run animation sequence, well, this is just an example of a script that would run. So it would clear the table. So op sequence, it clears the table. And then it adds a column with the, the names of the clips, clip punch, clip shot, clip run. So this is the sequence that, sequence that will run when I uh, run the script. And then you trigger the clip blender chop to ingest that list, um, the first item out of the list. And then the clip blender will pop that item off the list. So it'll pop that first animation, which would be clip punch. It'll play the animation. When the animation for clip punch is done, it'll pop clip slot shot off, load that animation and play it and then sequence them together. So if I run this script now, run script, then you'll see it popped it into um, the, the punch animation. And then after this, it'll play the other animation, which is the uh, clip shot. So this animation had trouble blending um, when I made this snippet. So I just kind of shut it down. Luckily and magically, because I had my fingers crossed this morning, I was concerned that it wasn't working 
there was a bunch of things I had to track down to get the blending working with um, with the assets that Adrian gave me, but it worked out. So um, so that's good news. But that gives you a basic idea. It's just filling this table up with a name. And then uh, so if I add a row here, I'm just going to do it manually. Type clip punch. Let's see if this works. Hit enter. And then you'll see I just played it. So that's all you're doing is you're filling up the sequence table with a sequence of animation. The clip blender reads the clips off the out of that out of that table, and off you go. Make sure that your spelling's correct, et cetera, and you're going to be good. So that's that's how the clip blender works in a nutshell. Um, so, uh, what did we have to do first? Well, we needed the animation from the FBX asset. So the way that you do that is again, I already told you, it's import select. And then you just drag and drop the FBX asset onto the um, select um, uh, chop. And then I can pick uh, animation and use parent animation. Yeah, turn that off. Yeah, so turn off use parent animation because it's looking to it. It thinks it's going to be on the inside, uh, but it's not. And then it'll pick. Then now I can pick the animation. So in this case, it's called mixamo.com. And then now I have the animation for that um, for that for that asset for that animation. So, uh, however, as well, uh, this is not over time. So if I pick one with animation, so I'll pick this guy. You'll see that the animation channels are time sliced, which means that the animation is coming is streaming out of the animation player based on the settings here, just like a movie a movie playback. So if we go here and I click on the playback page, I can, so for example, I can initialize the playback. I can push start. I can turn off play. And it should stop playing. It's not going, oh, probably because it's not the right asset, this guy. Parameters. So I should be able to control this asset by, by initializing it, pushing stop play. Don't know why that's not working. Oh, I guess it's local to the, oh, it's local to the uh, import select. So. And that's why we have used parent animation because all FBX assets will come with an embedded animation um, import select that's working from the parent. And so if you're gonna drag and drop your asset in and it's already gonna be playing animation. And that's why, because this network here by default is gonna be active. So let's just do that real quick. So I'm gonna import a fresh asset, which should be an FBX. Uh, we'll do the ninja, or yeah, we'll do the ninja. And you'll see that there's an animation playing. It's a subtle animation in this case, but he's kind of surfing there. So why is he animating? He's animating because um, this chop network here uh, is exporting animation onto it due to the import select I just showed you. So if I turn off the export flag, this animation will stop. So I'm going to unexport it. Okay. So now all you have left now is not an animated skeleton, but but a static skeleton with open transforms. So all of this skeleton has transforms that are free for us to override. So what we what we all we need to do is take one of these skeletons from one of these assets and then push animation back onto it. And so we'll extract the animation from all the different assets, get it massaged up, and then um, get it into clips, into clip vendor clip chops, and then um, we'll write into that table sequence system and we'll create a sequence and we'll play back animation. So uh, we have to extract the animation. And uh, there's a bunch of rules that the clip blender requires. One of and it should be well. You shouldn't be surprised that the anim if you're going to be blending from one clip of animation to another clip of animation, you have to have the same number of channels, and they have to be in the same order, and there can't be any spelling errors. So the the, the clips themselves have to match in the uh, names of the channels and the the number of channels and at the sample rates as well. Um, and so we discovered that. The animation, and I, I think we should just fix this because I think we can do it ourselves, is, is ensure that we have the whole uh, set of channels. But we, we did discover that Mixamo was, was only exporting animation clips. It was only exporting those channels that were animated. 
Uh, so some of the so this clip only has uh, twelve channels in it, whereas um, another one of the clips has uh, a different number, and they all had different numbers. But at least we got all the animation out of the Mixmo system. So the Mixmo system was correctly giving us animation channels. Um, so uh, so all I did was I wrote a script to go into the hierarchy, which is inside this FBX asset. And it went out and got all the components. And it read the trans, the late, and the rotate parameters from its unexported state. So um, if the clip blender was off, which is pushing onto it right now, you'll see that this that the hierarchy comes with transforms on it. And if we look at the um, asset, you'll see that it correctly looks in that pose. So I knew that the transforms were correctly there. All I had to do is get them, extract them off of the hierarchy. And then uh, once I did that, um, I did that with this, I made a special component that did that. And so uh, all you need to do is give it the uh, component that, um, that you want, the FBX asset, and then you click load and it'll go and it'll make um, a, it'll extract all the transforms and, and stick them up. Uh, into a, a script chop. And now I had the full set of channels baked, the baked channels ready to roll. So once you have that, <clears throat> then you can take the channels, the animation channels that you want, and you can put them into a merge chop. And this is uh, tricky settings, but it's important to understand. So the merge chop is very, very powerful for taking Different, differing numbers of channels of the same name, so there's in common names, merging them together and then um, taking the right input and, and shifting the length to the right length because this has the right number of channels in the right order. And it also has the right values for those channels that aren't present in this animation. And so uh, the merge chop, you can say, align to the minimum and maximum input. So this is the this has the most, the, the greatest length, and therefore that's what it's going to output. It's going to output the length of the greatest input. So, th so we got the same length here as we get here. And then this only has a subset of channels of this. So you say, for those names that are duplicate names, keep the last, keep the last channels. So these are the last channels because they're the second input, not the first input. And so it slots in, it replaces the channels here with these values. And so what you end up with is a, a, a clip with the right channel names and the right length, but they're, they're gonna be shuffled in order. So you have an incorrect order of channels and you have the correct order of channels. And so you put them into the reorder chop and you say uh, reference by name, it will sort these, in, these incoming channels which are incorrectly sorted by the second inputs order. And then uh, we also added some trimming and some and some um, stretching, which I'll sh we didn't get as far as we wanted to with stretching, but we were going to allow the characters to go slow motion and different things, which which I can show you if we have time. But um, okay, so so that all was encapsulated into a I, I called it today. It was I called it an FBX clip. So this system allows you to assign an FBX asset. Click load, and it'll go out, extract all the transforms from the skeleton, and then dump them in and reorder everything, and get it all polished up so that it's ready to be, it's so that it's consistent. And uh, then it's, of course, put into a clip chop, as I showed you before. That has to be the thing that you're re referring to. So this is the thing that gets loaded into the, um, into the clip blender. OK. So um, then. When the clip vendor loads the animation, so for example, by default, it loads a, po a pose slash clip. So without doing anything, if you just type a pose slash clip into this, it'll load this clip here. And uh, then we can push back the animation. And so the way that you put these, all these channels are named cleanly. And so for these more advanced sort of animation systems, there's a better you don't want to have to export each channel individually, which most people are used to probably exporting channels by going into this viewer 
and grabbing them and dropping them and dropping them on the parameter that you want them to go to. That's not going to be very fun if you have 396 channels. So uh, what you want to do instead is there's this naming nomenclature, which is this is the name of the of the parameter, or no, sorry, this is the name of the node, mix origin head. This is the name of the component, and then it has the t, and then it's separated by a colon, which means this is the name of the parameter. So the tx channel y z and rx ryz of this component will automatically get exported to, uh, and then on the common page of the uh, null chop or of any of any chop for exporting on the common page. There's a different export method, which is channel name is path colon parameter. So if you give it a valid component, this is just a relative path. The component is here. This is the FBX asset with the hierarchy. Then if I turn on the um, export flag, then now this is pushing these values onto the skeleton here. So what's nice is now I can, now that that loop is, is made, then I can go and I can change the path to say, for example, Ninja. So I can go to the clip blender and I could say Ninja instead. And uh, if we're lucky. Uh, oh, and then hit reset probably. Yeah, now uh, we've loaded the, the Ninja clip. So you don't have to do this manually, that's the point. We want the default pose to be a pose. So a pose and click reset. And instead of, of just hard hard loading a clip into the clip blender, we want to dynamically load it. Um, and so again, this is the same script I showed you before. It You clear the sequence table, which is referenced as the dat list here. You clear this, you clear the table, and then you populate the table with the um, with a sequence. This is older, um, this is before I made the component. So you have to tell it the full path to the clip chop. So it's gonna be uh, this sequence here. So if I run this um, script, it's going to populate the table and then tell the clip blender to go, which is dot trigger. And then we should see the ninja clip play, then the hip hop clip play, and then a post clip play. And there we go. And it is also blending um, uh, the animation. So you'll notice that there's a smooth blend between the clips. And that is controlled by the blend time. So the blend time is, is set to one second on its way in and one second on the way out. So when you're blending in, it will use this set. It'll, it'll, when you're blending into this clip, when you call trigger, it, when you blend into it, it will, um, it will use the blend time and then the next blend time is if you have a sequence of animations together, like in this case, it was ninja, then, uh, sorry, or sorry uh, ninja, then hip hop, and then a pose. It blends into ninja because you hit trigger. It blends into ninja, and then it blends out of ninja to hip hop, and it blends out of a hip hop to a pose. And then the last clip in the sequence, it will just continually loop them. It'll just continually loop. So actually, I think, I think Adrian actually gave me a better static state, which is standing idle. He just gave me this before uh, we started today. So let's just try that real quick, because this is even better than the A pose, which is a little bit weird. So now if we want to create this, Sorry? Yeah. So, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say, do you want to play from the Ableton file? Yeah, well, I'm building up so that people understand. Oh, okay, cool, yeah. cool. Yeah. No, you do, no, it's awesome. Um, yeah, so so anyway, so that's how the sequence works. But then ultimately, we wanted to control this from Ableton. So uh, don't know why that's erring, but at any rate, let me just reset that. Okay, so uh, so how to, so now we wanted to be able to clip to play a clip in Ableton and have it trigger. So for example. Um, I just trig. I just push play on this row, and the clip name is standing. And you'll see that there's an animation clip here called standing somewhere. This guy standing idle, which is the one I just played you before. And so, um, and just by playing, just because it played one clip means it's just going to loop that clip, right? It's going to blend in and then loop that clip. So how did that get? How did that happen? So. Uh, we use TD Ableton um, 
And for those who aren't aware, that is a um, very powerful system that allows you to communicate with Ableton uh, with pretty much everything in Ableton. It, you just have to drag the package in and then there's these components on the inside that allow you to extract information from, Python, or from um, Ableton and also send information back to Ableton to control Ableton. So in this case, we knew that we needed to get the name from the track, the name of the clip that plays from the track. So um, the uh, most, if not all, uh, um, um, components, this is the track component. You pick the, you pick the name of the track that you want. In this case, op two operator, the name is two operator. So make sure you name your, your um, columns differently. And so we got two operator and then I activated, or the callbacks are automatically on, but then you have to turn on enable callbacks. So that's the only thing I think that's not default here. Um, and then, um, then the, when the callbacks run, we can see here what it does. So um, the callback runs, uh, a, a clip that was playing changed. So this, this callback is run. It passes in an info object, the, and the info object is a dictionary. And so what you generally do is you just run debug info, and that will spit out the contents of the dictionary. Then you go looking in the dictionary for what you want. I didn't know what I was going to get, uh, or if I was going to get what I wanted. And thankfully, everything that was there that I needed. I needed to know the clip slot of uh, the index of the clip slot. Because another thing Adrian asked for, which I think is a great idea, is that he wanted the, the clip slot. He wanted a clip slot. He wanted the info from the clip slot that's playing. And so you'll see when I hit the uh, index two, it's going to change the clip slot here to be listening to that to that clip slot. And so that was an idea by, um, by Adrian, to, and that's really handy. So you don't need to have a, a different clip slot uh, component for every single clip. You just need one, and then you follow that trick there, which, which is um, you get the index of the clip slot, and then you just tell the clip slot uh, component to set the uh, current slot to clip slot index. That's it, done, it's really easy. Um, then the next thing was the animation part. So you've seen this already. So we needed the name of the clip. So the name of the clip is comes in as info names because that's the name that we type here. So when you click on this, the info object returns the name you make a string saying, for example, standing slash clip. And then you clear the sequence um, dat, which is right here. And you populate it with the name of the clip. So if the clip, if, 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 if there's a, if it finds the, um, a valid animation dat or animation component with the name, then it, populates that row in the sequence dot, and then it triggers the clip blender. So it's that easy. It's just a couple lines of code, and we got exactly what Adrian wanted. So let's try um, a pose. OK. And as well, we should turn up the music now. It's always more fun with music. We're clicking for some reason, so I don't know why that clicking is from. But, um, do, are we getting audio, uh, Marcus? Not from my computer. Yeah, not much. Can't hear much. A little bit, though? No. Really? Hold on. Hmm. That's weird. Do I have to click B here or something? Really? Nothing, huh? Nothing. It was working before. Now? No. Okay. Well, at any rate. So nothing, huh? No, your voice and clicking. 
Hmm. Okay. Well, at any rate, there's music playing. Take my word for it. Um, Can you sing it for us? <laughs> and then, um, so so now we can switch to different. It's way cooler if there's music, but Jared, why don't you turn on the speakers in your studio? So you okay, good idea. Okay, good idea. Okay. So we don't have to sing along. Well, you can sing along anyway, but right, right, right. Okay, I'm gonna get this studio speakers going. Uh, uh, Unreal Audio oh, Speakers Universal Pod. Oh, I have to go to ASIO. Hopefully, this doesn't break anything. Okay, can you guys still hear me? We can hear it. Okay, and I okay, so I'll turn it up. Okay, you got a little audio now. Yeah, yeah. Down the bass slide the Okay, so um, so now you'll see the music and the cue changes together. So um, so that's. That's all it is, really. It's just uh, sending a sending a, a script across uh, with the name and the index of the sequence, and then uh, and then we play the animation, uh, and that's it. So, uh, as well, uh, Adrian asked if he could emit particles. <laughs> so that is that's another system here that we can show you. So, um, so first I'll show you. Um, how you would go about getting the skeleton converted into something that can emit particles. So um, if we look inside here, the way that this works is um, the object chop allows you to take a reference object and, and feed it a, a, a component using a target object, and it'll give you the relative trans world space transform of that um, object. So we needed the world space transforms from all the bones in the skeleton, right? So um, if we look inside of Ninja, whoops. Uh, but anyway, you need to know, well, that's the clip, sorry. So we want to know the bone positions, which if we go in close, you'll see there's a bunch of bones. It does, they don't look like bones, they look like nulls, but these are actual transforms. And so we need to get all the transforms. So take note that there's a bunch of transforms in the hands. There's only one on his elbow, there's only one on his shoulder. So the best we could do with short notice was emit from each one of these positions. But um, so the question was, how do I get the world space transforms for all of these nulls? And so, um, hey Jared, we just lost your screen there. Just now? Yeah, it's just the cameras right now. Uh, okay, so I will go back to our system and I'll share my screen again. Good? Yeah? Yeah, it's up. Okay, so uh, I was just showing uh, how we needed to get the, the null positions, the world space positions of all, the, all of these nulls, which are the transforms that are deforming him. And um, this is how we did it. So uh, I gotta go into the particle system. So <clears throat> the object chop allows you to extract um, a world space transform from a from the position of an object or like from an object a, a geo object in space and you just give it a relative object so if you want to know the world space transform you can just give it the ambient light an ambient light because that's going to give you definitely zero 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 because there's no transform on an ambient light and so this is the, re the reference object and then but the interesting thing is here you can actually give it a dat and you can populate the dat with a one row for each 
uh, geometry or geo object that you want to you want to calculate for. So I fed in all of the um, all of the components, from, which is just all of the object comps, into an opfind app, and then I combine that with another column which is ambient one. So now I'm going to get the transform for every geo object, which is going to be a tx, ty, tz, rx, ry, rz, s, x, y, z, and then two extra channels, which is the transform order. And it's going to give us that in the object chop. And so you can see that here. So you can see, and I don't know, this is garbage, this first set, but then you'll see it gives you head, the head um, channels. X, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, and two extra channels, transform order, rotation order. So I, we don't need the transform order or the rotation order, so we need to drop that from the list. So I got, at first I get, I just, I rename all the channels to get rid of this extra thing that it put on top, and I don't know what these R's are for. So I renamed them, and then I deleted the shit I didn't need, and then I deleted the scale channels, because all we needed was the translates and the rotates, and then uh, I put them into an array. So you have uh, a row of samples. One sample is a, is, is a position in point. So the first object's position in world space is the first column of samples. The second object is the second, and so on. So now we have extracted uh, the points for the whole skeleton. And you can see that here. So if we start animating, uh, and look up here, you'll see that we're getting animation, All right? The, the, the order of connectivity doesn't matter. We only care about the point positions. Okay. Okay. So then from there, um, uh, I facet, I don't even think I needed to facet it. Um, I added velocity because you want the particles to fly off the positions based on the velocity, so their direction will be, and their speed will be determined by the by the initial velocity. If you, and that's the v um, uh, point attribute. So when you feed in the v point attribute into the particle swap, you can control how the particles birth. And then um, as well, uh, I I had to slot them into a v attribute. So don't worry about that. It's deeper. Well, this is how I calculated the slope. So um, this, this is the position. If you use just put put attach a slope chop, now you've got your velocity, just single slope chop. And you have to turn on slope per sample. So it's going to calculate the slope the XYZ, 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 all the way through the array. And then um, and then it, now it's connected. Uh, and now it's now those point position or those velocities are added as an attribute to the point stop using a chop to you. And then in they go to the particle system. So now the particle stop is working. So if we just look here, um, you can see they're emitting off of um, the geometry. And then um, I also changed the alpha. Uh, I, I did a post particle system. I went back into chops with life. And if you divide life zero by life one, you get a, norm a normalized value over the life of the particle. And then I use that as the alpha parameter. So, uh, and it looks up. So it looks up this curve, which is in the animation editor. So it starts off opaque, or sorry, uh, transparent, and then it becomes opaque, and then it trails off slowly to being transparent. And then that is used um, in the uh, point sprite. That's used by the point sprite shader to shade. And then I just attached a circle um, to the point sprite shader, and then here we go. So this is the end result. There's some compositing tricks, but. Uh, and then, um, as well, we wanted to, there's other things going on here. The color changes are actually happening due to automation in the clip. So we wanted to prove that we could drive animation inside touch um, using the automation lane uh, of, this, um, of this MIDI clip. So if you go into Ableton, and you go, if you go to envelopes, um, and you go to the MIDI controls, and you can pick, you have 128 channels, I think, or no, maybe only 120, or 119 channels. Um, and and, and uh, Adrian chose to pick um, the last channel, and he, and he animated it. 
So the animation of the color of the point sprite, which is here. So this gets extracted from TD Ableton. So that so that hit that that automation lane is is automated, and then you'll see it comes in here as MIDI T1 TDA MIDI channel one controller 19. You'll see here's the animation here. And so that gets selected out here. And that's the animation channel. So that's the automation lane directly inside of Ableton. So you can see that happening. As it goes up, you'll see touch sync. So we have animation coming across. And then uh, I just rearranged it and uh, it's driving the this color. And then uh, I used a pick a pick function to extract the color from the top. And so that's what drives the color of the sprite um, based, based on that. So uh, so that means that animation will be different in every case. So he animated everything differently. So, um, so there's that. We wanted to get to more states, essentially, from um, more states from Ableton MIDI. There, there's also MIDI notes. So you'll see he, some of these clips have uh, MIDI note like this clip does here. So belly dancing has um, these, these, how do I get out of, oh, I'm about to turn this off, I got the notes, right, yeah. So these animations, or these clip, or these notes um, are coming in right here. So note 63, 65, and so on. And so we were experimenting a little bit with the ways that um, Adrian wanted the animation to get, or those notes to get converted, so in this case, he wanted them all in a single channel and then um, maybe envelope them so you get different types of behaviors. We didn't get to connect it. I get time to connect it all. Um, in addition to that, um, it's only a few minutes left anyway, or we're already over. I'll just really quickly show you the compositing network. So um, it's a multi pass render. Uh, the first render is just the um, the sky background, the ground plane, and the um, character Adrian, and then a second render pass renders the particle system only, but it keeps the depth buffer present, which um, occludes the particles that are behind him, and then um, and then I added another render because I wanted to do more. I wanted to pop him out front a little bit more. So I used another render of him um, separately from the background. Then um, a little, you know, standard old feedback trick. So uh, it's just uh, the particles into an over, back to feedback, uh, leveled to make it transparent over time. So if I increase my, it's going to blow it out, obviously. So 0 0.8 there, 0 0.5. And then um, this particle layer is then put into a bloom effect, which is in the palette, just to give it a little bit more glow. And then that, that's composited over the uh, generic one, which I threw in a little edge for a little texture on the, you'll see the texture on the, there's an edge on the shadow below. And it also gave the clouds a little bit more texture, so whatever. And then, um, and then, that was all comped together a little bit more. And then I did a radio blur on the particles and him. And that gives us this ethereal sort of god ray kind of effect. And then those are added together to give you the um, whole final image, I think. And then I multiplied a little bit of a vignette in there as well, a vignette effect. And that's it. So. Um, other than that, I don't think there's a need to get into anything else. I'll show you one quick last thing. The, he's def, why is he deforming? Uh, why is this geometry deforming with his uh, uh, with his skeleton? The material that matters in the material. When you attach a material to a character, like an FBX file, which is going to come loaded with one already, so you can go grab that one if you want to improvise and do something else. Like for example, it comes default. All FBX assets come with a default. You'll you'll go inside and find where the mesh object is. And it'll come default with a Fong shader, which I deleted out of here, but they'll come with a Fong. But I will be wanted PBR. So the PBR shader also comes with the deform page. <clears throat> 
the way you set this up is um, hopefully your geometry will come in with PCAP path zero. Um, you can apply more than one set of texture coordinates to geometry, but by default, most packages are going to give you that that attribute. And then um, the SOC, uh, you give it the SOC with the capture data, which is the geometry SOC that I just showed you. So that's, again, really quickly, that's inside the mesh object. Sorry. It's inside the mesh object here. Um, it's this guy. This is the guy with the PCAP data. See? PCAP data is on the D, it's a D hit detail attribute. And then you just give it the root of the of the hierarchy. So I figured the root of the hierarchy was probably this guy. And it turned out to be true. And uh, just fill this out. Oh no, you don't even give it the skeleton. You, you could give it either one, but I just gave it the root of the FBX component itself. And that's the equivalent to the root of whatever else is inside. So um, that's how his deforming body happens. Um, otherwise, we PBR'd it by just adding the maps that I was given, which are just uh, the base color, occlusion map, and the normal map, which gives it the nice, uh, you know, the shirt looks good. And then there's a light with a single shadow. Light 2 has shadows turned on. And you can see if I knock that out, we kill the shadow. And it's kind of pushed up pretty high. And then it's a cone light as well. So um, that's how all that adds up to this. So. Adrian, do you think I'm missing anything else? Huh. No? I don't hear Adrian. Is he talking? Oh, he's muted. Yeah. I'm muted. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, no, I think you did a really beautiful job of going in depth at all the different like aspects of what's going on. I mean, Really, it feels just like we just had some fun, and I mean, this is just like the beginning. You know, it's pretty amazing what you can do these days. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm kind of just, I'm, I'm just enjoying the entire experience. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm blown away that you were scanned only three days ago, right? So. Well, I, I was scanned last year. Oh, you were scanned last year. Okay. Yeah, but, it just but took then. Get that process, the, like, with the, the whole, when when did you design. rig the when did you rig this character, this asset? Like literally Wednesday night. Yeah, so you just you had the model, but then you just recently rigged it. Yeah, yeah literally Vlad sent sent me the model like Wednesday night or something, and we chatted, and I was like, we were just like, oh, let's get it done. And obviously, you know, somebody commented about the geometry, and like, you know, Mixamo is not the most perfect and most precise way to rig because you have like limitations because it's a web-based interface but it's it gets it you know for for like a low throw it together kind of thing it works it's totally rad and you can always it's a it's a non-destructive process so you can have, you can always like you know add you know switch it up and add to it and so i think one of the most significant parts was this whole like td ableton integration where i really was like i want to like have some like more in-depth control that feels more intuitive so i'm actually excited to play with the like base level like logic that you helped me implement where like it updates the clip and we can just like you know i can start building out a, an audio visual set i think that's really for me the, 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 the part you know yeah and it's encouraging to me as well that i from not well, I had to do the clip extractor, but we I think we'll we can automate that in our importer. But otherwise, like what's running the Python lines, what's running this is just six lines of code. They had to be stuck yeah. in the right place, but but nevertheless, uh, that's all it was. Yeah, there's nothing there. Yeah, so. yeah um, I mean it, it, it's all right there. I mean, you guys are doing an amazing job. I mean, the software is amazing, and I'm, I'm, I'm so, always so inspired every time I open the designer. And just explore. There's always so many possibilities. So it's, it's it was just a really cool experience getting to work on this review. So I'm just really grateful, you know. I, I don't really have much more else to say. I, I think you really like, you know. Like, I, I was just like, oh, cool. I guess I'm a virtual guinea pig for today. This is gonna be funny and and hilarious. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm so good. Thank you. You know, I, I'm so honored to be like here with you know, just like I, I learned so much through this experience. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed hanging out with you too, man. Uh, <laughs> they're great ideas, and uh, yeah, yeah. And, they're, and they're really high quality assets. I mean, that's that's a killer. Yeah. 
So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now, now, we, now we all want to do top notch work. I'm just so stoked so, 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 kind of to have them in my life. So they're, they're amazing. So, yeah. This is my favorite jump here. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so silly. I mean, like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so do we yeah. have should we field any questions do you guys have any questions incoming from online or? I'm, I'm i'm reading one on youtube right now which is how much heavy how much heavy is transmitting data from ableton compared to the animation comments? oh and jared maybe turn off maybe turn off the music in the background uh, then yes you, yes yes everybody else comes through better okay so um how heavy is the data coming in from Ableton versus what? The animation comp. Well, um, it's, it's kind of similar what's going on. Um, I can't, I can tell you this, that chops are very, very fast. So, um, you know, the, the, the fact that we're dealing with um, 396 channels of of transform data here and possibly processing it later and then re-exporting it back onto the skeleton um, it's really not that expensive so that type that system architecture is really quite well tuned um, and uh, and and that's all c plus plus based stuff um, the, the channel data that's coming across from um, from ableton is like for example this channel here, which is the animation, the automation channel. Um, well, it's going, it's coming from uh, Ableton's command queue or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, it's on a, a particular thread, which isn't high priority. Uh, so, you know, channel data inside ch chopped out of the clip blender is going to be perfectly smooth, but you'll see the data coming in off of. Um, uh, off of Ableton is not perfect. And so that's something to be aware of, and we don't have a solution um, for that. I mean, a, a quick solution for controller data, a really easy solution for controller data is just to stick a lag in there, and then you get immediate smoothness. So um, that's an option for some things. It's not an option for things that, like, for example, turn on and off. Um, but it would probably be perfect for his color. So um, if I wanted to attach that, it's quite easy to just insert that. Um, Forever. So, um, is again, uh, you know, these these um, on the inside, like these, it's really just OSC data coming in, and you'll see the cook time is really really low. So um, you want to be efficient with how many things you're using. Adrian's idea to um, use the same clip slot component for the whole track and just use the track index current index to switch the clip slot worked perfectly i was concerned that it was going to drop a frame or two by when it switched but it didn't seem to care and I, we got all the data we needed um out of it so um I, yeah I, I hope that kind of answers your question I, the bottom line is this is all chop channels this is all chop channel driven and therefore it's very high performance um we can you can continue to add more processing and logic and interactivity to this without uh, too much worry about going overboard. So, um, yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, very nice. Um, should we, Jix, you said, or Adrian, sorry, you said there was a video actually that you yeah. wanted to. Uh... Jix wants, wants us to play the one minute, uh, the one minute video of. Uh, yeah. hmm? I have sent it, Marcus. You have it. Yeah, I've got it here. Let's see. I'm just going to play that. Okay. Mm. So, so what is this? This is um, Will Smith, I believe. Will Smith getting Will scanned. Smith. And uh, Jake, are you there? And what did we actually do? It looks like he might just can boot off, but play anyway. 
Okay, let's just play it. We're in the scan, we're, we're in the scan oh. truck spaceship. And what did we actually just do? So we just 3D scanned you. You're gonna be an avatar. Oh. <laughs> I've been 3D scanned before, son. I'm gonna get the teardrop, you know, from the dudes that have been 3D scared. So there's 210 shots. Every angle, the good and the bad. The good and the bad, yeah. Oh, yeah Damn. Right. And then what happens is you can regenerate a 3D image of me from all of these different angles and you can create some photo real foolishness. Oh yeah, all day. Yeah. Tell that it's, yeah. that it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> we made a lot of money with that face. That's, one, right? <laughs> that's why I didn't have sex till I was in my twenties. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a that's, that's a nice note. Very nice. That's a nice uh, good finisher. Jiggs is tall. Wow, he's much taller yeah. than Will Smith. I think Jigs are here. We just can't see you, but um, turn on your camera. Oh, and maybe not hear you either. But did you hear him? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> thanks so much. I think. Thank Happy you. Friday, everyone. Happy yeah. Friday, yeah. and we'll see you again in three weeks. Oh. And uh, I posted right. the, I, I posted the link on the YouTube chat again, but. Uh, if you want to submit, if you want to submit your files to in session, then by all means, click the link, read the thing, check out the form, hit send. And um, also uh, happening right now, they're 20 minutes into it, is a Peter Mettler, filmmaker, After party. Um, and he's doing a two-hour uh, show and tell of using Touch Designer Mixa, making his films to uh, audience of filmmakers in Europe. So that's uh, a link that's, where's the link? Well, one way of getting there is going to the showcase, going to Isabel's uh, flattening the curve, popping yeah, down Greg, to- Greg, 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 I'll yeah. just post, I'll, I'm just posting it in the, uh, I'm just posting it right okay. into YouTube, okay? And it's here as well on the on, in the showcase to so watch the show live and it's uh, happening uh -huh. right now. All right, so Isabel, last question, what's the telescope behind you? I know. <laughs> It's uh, it's not very big, but it helps me see Saturn a little bit bigger, um, and of course the Moon absolutely perfectly, and uh, it's uh, it's even in Toronto actually it works quite well, and it it makes me happy. <laughs> That's all nice. I got. Good. Yeah. Um. So I think, um, yeah, we'll call it a day, a Friday. Friday. A May Day. May As, Day. Um, Stefan Kraus was mentioning that um, <laughs> this is the substitute for going rioting in Berlin. <laughs> um, <laughs> no rioting. Kind of a much better um, substitute, but. <laughs> okay, uh, guys. So, yeah, happy Friday. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, and, yeah, yeah thanks, thanks, everyone. Big, big thanks to our guests. I really appreciate all of you. Thank yeah, you so great hanging out, Adrian. Okay, yeah, see fun. ya. Okay. Bye. And we'll see you soon again.